Two, two more. Okay, for everybody who is going to be participating in the hearing, uh, if you can, please turn on your cameras. Uh, this is the Rules and Legislative Oversight Committee. Uh, we are hearing uh, five nominations today for uh, different items. Uh, we will uh, first recognize my colleagues who are on this hearing. Uh, we have Councilman Chris Burnett. Uh, we have Councilman Mark Conway. We have Councilman Eric Costello. Councilman James Torrance. Um, and I think that is it. And we have uh, Richard uh, Kumreich, uh, staff to the committee. Um, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we will get started with EA 21-0063, Dr. Yvonne Bronner for Member of Commission on Aging and Retirement Education. If you can just please give us uh, a brief uh, one, one minute or less introduction of who you are and uh, why you are interested in serving on that commission. And then members of the committee will ask questions. Uh, we'll go through the first four nominees. Uh, we'll take a vote on all four of those nominees and then we'll move on to, uh, to Alice Kennedy for the Department of Housing and Community Development. Uh, so Director uh, Kennedy, if you wanna take like a few minute break, if you need to get anything else in order, uh, it'll be a few minutes before we get to you. Uh, I see we're also joined by Councilwoman Odette Ramos. Uh, so, you, uh, Dr. Yvonne Bronner, if you can take it away. You're on, you're on mute. Um, you... All right. Yeah. So now I can start again. Yes. Uh, yeah. to, to the esteemed members of this committee, I, my name is Yvonne Bronner. I'm a professor in behavioral health sciences at Morgan State University. And my reason for wanting to be on this committee is that uh, my area of um, uh, research and interest is the life course. And um, as you, uh, and in that um, presentation of the life course, uh, obviously the last stage is the aging process. But what we say is that one begins aging at birth. And now, uh, as we look at preconception health, what we know is a lot of the stage for aging begins during the planning stages for family development. And so uh, if I am a part of the committee, what I would love to do is to promote the life cycle so that people age well throughout their lives. And at every stage of their lives, they are living their best selves. Um, so that as we all enter, uh, the latter stages of our lives, we are also we can look back and see our accomplishments, but we can also say that we are continuing to accomplish and to contribute. Thank you. Thank you. Any uh, questions from the committee? No. Nope. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, we will move on to the next uh, bill, EA twenty one zero zero six four. Odessa Dorkins, member of Commission on Aging and Retirement Education. Uh, I, yeah. I don't see her on yet. Uh, I don't see anybody from the mayor's office. We may be looking for if somebody can speak for if she's the only nominee who hasn't uh, signed on yet. Okay. All right, so we'll we'll move on to the next one and come back to that. The next one is EA twenty one dash zero zero six five Claudia Baylog, member of commissioning in aging, uh, retirement education. Thank you, and thank you to the esteemed members of this committee uh, for allowing me to join you today. My name is Claudia Baylog. I am a lead researcher with eleven ninety nine SEIU. United Healthcare Workers East. We represent 10,000 workers across the healthcare spectrum. In Baltimore City, we represent thousands of workers um, who support uh, the most vulnerable members in our community in skilled nursing facilities. There are also thousands of workers who have been risking their lives every day through this pandemic uh, to provide uh, residential home and community-based services um, to the very constituents that this committee is um, trying to uplift the voice of and, and take care of. Um, I think the worker voice is an important one when we look at Baltimore City and the vulnerabilities of the workforce that supports our aging population. Um, 
need to be taken into respect. Uh, the transit issues, the low pay, the disproportionate amount of workers in this workforce who live in poverty themselves. And uh, to any extent that I can, that I can bring the prism of the workforce perspective um, to this commission, I would be incredibly appreciative of having that opportunity. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, any members of the committee with questions? Seeing none, we'll move on to the next nominee. Um, EA 21-0066, Otis uh, Friedman for a member of the BMZA. Good afternoon, hi. Uh, and thank you to the members of this team committee. My name is Otis W. Freeman, and I am an attorney with the state of Maryland. Um, I formerly was a, I formerly practiced in the state's attorney's office um, for approximately, approximately seven years where I was a lead attorney in over a hundred uh, jury and bench bench trials. Um, I was then promoted to the major investigations unit where I also um, prosecuted cases there as well. Um, after leaving the city attorney's office, I began to work with the city of Maryland, where I advised the agency in various different areas, including, um, including bankruptcy and civil areas, and also litigate in workers' compensation, criminal and civil areas as well. Um, I am strongly committed to the public service area. As you may have seen from my resume, I worked, I've worked in public service for the past 11 years. And in fact, and I am an active member of a number of bar associations. I'm very interested in working for the BMZA because um, not only am I you know, have a strong commitment to public service, but I also am a lifelong Baltimore City resident. I currently uh, live in Southwest Baltimore, but I currently live in Baltimore, of course. And um, I invested to to continue the development of Baltimore City and to devote my time and abilities to serve its citizens. I believe we're I believe serving on the um, committee, but the BMZA would be a great way to serve the, the citizens and to continue work in the public sector. Thank you. Okay, I have some questions, but I'll see if uh, any members of the committee have any uh, questions for Mr. Freeman. Anybody? Okay. I, uh, Mr. Freeman, so uh, can you just elaborate a little bit on what uh, your knowledge is of Baltimore City zoning code and uh, why specifically, you know, are you interested in the BMZA as opposed to many of the other um, boards and commissions that the city has? Yes, I've, I've never officially practiced in the in zoning area. Um, I, do, I do know that's in Article 32 of the Baltimore City Code. Um, however, I have a long history, um, especially in the last four years of learning new areas of law very quickly. Again, I, my job right now is to advise our client in all areas of law um, where I have to quickly digest new information, statutes and laws, and interpret those and argue with those uh, both in orally and written advocacy in, in all across the state of Maryland. So I believe that those types of skills would be necessary to um, and beneficial to serve on the BMZA. Okay, and do you have any um, any real estate law uh, background? No, I do not have a real estate law um, background, um, but I do have a strong uh, background in civil litigation. Gotcha. So, I mean, the the BMZA, as I'm sure you know, is a very uh, very active board, um, and one that. You know the city council engages a lot on because there's different you know land uh, questions and and variances that are are needed uh so what do you view the the city council people's role per district uh when it comes to zoning so i'm, I'm sure you've watched some of the zoning hearings and you see council people will typically come if there's you know an item of of a priority in their district that's before the bmca um, what, what do you view as the, you know, each individual council person's role uh, when coming to the BMZA and, you know, what kind of weight is, is given to that um, if they're supporting a specific project in their district? Just to make sure I understand your question, you're asking, your, your question is, what is the, the specific 
person council's person's role in different type of zoning issues yeah so I, let me let me just elaborate um so i can clarify a little bit so if, if there is a, a need for a rezoning for instance in uh in any individual council district uh, the policy is that the council person in that district would have to submit that legislation to change the zoning um items that don't get to that level or you know may be able to get their desired use uh, by going to the bmza um, the bmza obviously is an independent board um, however when council people approach the bmza obviously that's one step before ultimately a council person has the right to rezone a property if they want to have a specific use on that property and so i'm just wondering uh, what your view is, and I asked the same question of the last person who was uh, who applied for the BMZ. I think it was at the end of last term. Like, what what weight would you, as a member, give when a council person is coming and supporting a variance in their district? Okay. Um, well, I believe I, I believe it should be given some weight um, if the person is, but of course we would have to go by the by the law. So whether the statute, of course, it allows it it, it takes it to, to consideration whether that prevents, for instance, overcrowding of the land or what uh, the conservation of population. So I think that the, the major concern is to take into consideration whether the zoning um, is for the best, is, is, is best for the, the citizens of the of that area of the, in Baltimore City. So um, I think we need to, I think of course we need to hear all the evidence, weigh the evidence, weigh the different exhibits, whatever are presented from um, the, the presentation of that council, that council person and or the person who is asking for the zoning allowance. But I think more, more than anything, we need to just follow the law and make sure that that, that is being implemented correctly. Okay, uh, Councilman Costello. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Freeman, thank you for your interest in serving on the BMZA. Uh, I have a question about standing for a community group or a resident. Um, oftentimes, uh, land use entitlements, uh, which require um, an appeal to the BMZA, um, may be supported and opposed by various parties. One thing that uh, often happens is there's a question of uh, geographic proximity and how that ties to whether or not you have standing. For example, um, uh, I'm a resident of the Federal Hill neighborhood. Uh, if I were to um, oppose uh, say a proposed project in Homeland uh, that is seeking an appeal where Councilman Conway uh, serves as the representative. Um, the weight of my testimony or opposition or support of um, theoretically would be less than say uh, some of the residents that live in the Homeland neighborhood because they're more directly impacted uh, by the uh, appeal that's being requested. So my question is how would you how would you weigh um, the how would you weigh or weight rather uh, the positions of residents and or associations uh, based on the proximity to the project where the appeal is being requested? Does that make sense? Uh, yes, I think it makes um, a lot of sense. So I think I believe again. I think the first thing is to follow statute and to follow the law and how those would apply to the, the request. Um, typically in any any situation there is, uh, if I'm in front of a judge, there are different factors that are taken into consideration. So I think that's one, I think the weight that we should be given someone who has standing or who is in that exact area should definitely be given more weight than someone who lives with another on the other side of the city. Um, so I, 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 I agree or I, I believe that there should definitely be different factors, and one of the factors should be that should be considered is where that person lives in proximity to the actual um, zoning, uh, or um, the, or to allow where the zoning variance would be allowed to um, be placed. So yes, I, I definitely would put more more weight to a person who lives in closer proximity. Thank you. I appreciate that. And the reason I ask the question is because in most instances in statute. It is not clearly delineated who has standing to or not to um, testify in support or in opposition to a proposed appeal in front of the BMZA. In fact, I believe there's only one instance uh, that I can think of in which it does. Um, so I think it's, you know, for me, it's of great interest to understand um, 
how you would um, rule on, on the board in terms of who you would give standing to and, and uh, who you would give uh, less standing to uh, for lack of um, not knowing the, the legal terminology behind that. But I do appreciate that you um, clearly understood my question and um, would clearly give more standing to those in closer proximity. So thank you, Mr. Freeman. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'm, I'm good for now, but may come back with another question after my colleagues go through. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, no problem. Um, I see Councilman Terrence, you have a question? You're still muted. Hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Perfect. Mr. Freeman, my questions are more related to the processes. I'm going to be very clear. I have frustrations with the BNCA. <laughs> Um, one is when an opinion was given um, in a case in which I oppose, the drafted official opinion had another council person's name in it. So my question is, as a board member, <laughs> will you, one, be clear in giving your legal background that we have a consistency and professionalism in terms of how opinions are handed down the way they're worded and how they're consistent with the current statutes. Uh, yes, and then, um, of course, uh, that was unfortunate that that occurred. Um, I am a lit litigator by trade. I write, uh, this is give more of my background, I write numerous motions, um, numerous different types of, of of legal writings in different areas of law. So um, my goal is to always be accurate and my goal is always to be um, as, as um, detail oriented as I possibly can be. So that would certainly be my goal is to always um, listen to all the evidence, take all the factors and considerations, follow the law and to be um, as professional as possible. Um, I think that is something that I, my career has definitely been um, noted to be is that I've always been a professional, regardless of whether I'm in the courtroom, whether I'm working within my own office. I'm also a member of the Burnt Rental State Bar Association. Um, so I've also gone through those different types of professional organizations as well. So yes, I would definitely be sure to um, be detail oriented, detail oriented and to provide um, thorough and accurate opinions. Thank you. Also in your position, if selected, will you vocalize if a community is raising issues or concerns related to data that we need from city agencies will you hold any decision until that date that said agency provides that data for before moving forward yes um i i'm in front of commissioners and been in front of judges my entire career and i since i always have appreciated when a um, judge or commissioner um will take the time to fully wait and receive all the information and all of the data and all of the arguments in order to make a very um, informed decision and one that is fair to all to all the parties. So yes, I would. Thank you, Mr. Freeman. I yield back to the chair. Thank you very much. Uh, any other colleagues have any questions? Mr. Chair, uh, I have another question. I right, go ahead, Councilman. Um, thank you. Um, Mr. Freeman, um, oftentimes, um, we don't have a formal term to describe this, but we usually have what's known as community associations of record. Uh, those are, um, by and large, 501c3s that are registered with the Department of Planning's Community Association Directory. Um, those organizations are, um, you know, most neighborhoods have one. Uh, in some instances, there's two, uh, but that's an uh, an association that has been doing work in that community for a sustained period of time, decade, two decades, three decades. Uh, oftentimes uh, we see when there is a controversial issue uh, and there is disagreement within that organization uh, that the side that does not prevail uh, will splinter off and create a new organization um, specifically geared toward that one issue, right? So for example, um, you might have the 
uh, Main Street Neighborhood Association that deals with all the things that a normal community association deals with. They deal with community cleanups, they deal with constituent services, they have a newsletter, they help out the small businesses in the neighborhood, they have block parties, so on and so forth. But then there's an issue that may come in front of uh, a quasi-judicial body such as BMZA or liquor or whatever. Um, and uh, there is, um, you know, not consensus within the group. Uh, it's a controversial issue and a splinter group uh, is created uh, to deal with that issue. Um, can you talk to me a little bit about or explain how you would deal with standing that would be given to a community association of record that is traditionally operated in that community for a sustained period of time versus an association uh, that is kind of splinters off and it is a one-off uh, intended to deal with just one specific issue. Oh, completely understood. And I, again, want to just um, reiterate, as I've, I've stated before, that I think it's always important to first uh, consider and to follow the the art the, the, the Baltimore City article, which um, which uh, guides zoning um, in Baltimore City first. But I, I definitely think that um, when considering an issue and considering standing of a of a um, association where there is a main association and one splinters off, I think it's important to again look at look at that association which has been working in the community, um, is knowledgeable about um, the needs of the community, one who actually who actually represents that neighborhood or that as association for the longest amount of time. Um, and can also speak for the residents within that area. So um, if that is the, the association, which, which is the main association, which it would be in most instances, I think that they should definitely receive more consideration. Um, I don't wanna say flat out that that would always be the case, or they, that would be the strongest factor. Again, I think the law should be the strongest factor, but I think that should be definitely um, a strong factor and they should be able to receive more standing than a group that has not has not been doing the work or has not been um, historically representing that area. Thank you, Mr. Freeman. That, that's very helpful uh, context. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, thank you. Does anybody on the committee have any other questions? No. Okay. Let me see if uh, Richard has um, has, has Odessa joined us. Um, no, Mr. Chair, I, uh, I sent emails to the mayor's office so far with no response. There is one call in user. If you want me to open up, I can find out. Yeah, let's, let's find that out just just in case. That's, okay. that's what it is. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah. ma'am. Go ahead. Okay. Please. Okay. Oh. Um, my name, as I said before, is Odessa Dorkins. Okay. I'm a gerontologist, and I organize the um, Maryland Centenarians Committee for the State of Maryland. I owned and operated uh, assistant living facilities in the state of Maryland for over 25 years. I have, taught geronto I have taught and lectured gerontology. I am interested in the board because um, I have a problem of seniors being stereotyped. Also, I serve on the Alzheimer's Association and committee and I do lectures and workshops. Also, I have a 98-year-old mother that I am working with. So I love the aging population, the seniors evaluation and services, senior care, home and community-based, seniors companion programs. I would like to work on some of those programs to, to elaborate on what is being done and can be done for the seniors. Okay, thank you very much. I'm glad we uh, we opened up the phone line. 
um, to find you there. Um, does any members of the committee have any questions? Um, hearing and seeing none. Um, thank you uh, to, uh, to the four of you for your willingness to serve the city. Um, we're we're going to switch things up a little bit. We're actually going to hear uh, from from uh, Alice Kennedy um, for Commissioner for Department of Housing and Community Development. Um, we're going to take a, uh, a three minute break and come back and start that hearing. Uh, the, the four of you that just uh, testified, you, you don't need to wait um, on the call. Um, I actually suggest that you don't because it might be an extended hearing. Um, and then we will, uh, you know, we'll discuss the next steps and we will we'll let you know the, the result of that. Uh, but we're going to take a three minute recess right now now and then um and then we'll get back to um to alice kennedy so thank you very much thank you okay if everybody's on the call uh who's participating if you can turn your cameras on uh for this upcoming hearing this is the rules and legislative oversight committee uh we'll now be hearing ea 21-0062 alice kennedy commissioner of department of housing and community development uh, I am sorry about the delay. We're working through something uh, on the previous hearing. Um, so, Director uh, Kennedy, first off, thank you for your willingness to serve. Um, it's been a pleasure working with you. Uh, you've done a great job, in my opinion, uh, when you know in the interim role. So, I'm excited to see that that you have been appointed or nominated uh, to serve in a, a permanent capacity. Um, this your staff um, has has only good things to say about you, and so that's a good thing. And uh, your staff has also done an excellent job. Uh, we deal with uh, Stephanie, as you know, quite often, and she's very responsive. And so that is a great reflection on you and the housing department. Um, and so um, unlike the previous hearing where we're trying to keep each nominee to a one minute introduction, obviously the floor is yours. Um, and we'd love for you to, to give us as much information as you can about um, we, we all know you, but also like, you know, what, what you've seen within the housing department as, as the interim director, but also, you know, what direction you're looking to take and certain uh, challenges you're working on. So please um, take it away. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Alice Kennedy, Acting Commissioner of the Department of Housing and Community Development. I'm extremely thankful for the opportunity to stand before the Rules and Legislative Oversight Committee today to discuss my executive nomination as Commissioner of the Department of Housing and Community Development. I've had the opportunity to get to know many of you throughout my work in city government as Sustainability Coordinator in the Department of Planning, in my role as the Deputy Commissioner of the Office of Homeownership and Housing Preservation, and more recently for the past year as the Acting Commissioner for the Department of Housing and Community Development. Um, for a little bit of background, my, my mother was born in Baltimore. And while I grew up in Cleveland Heights, Ohio, I would spend the summers, vacations, and holidays visiting my grandparents and extended family here within the city and the uh, surrounding Baltimore County. My grandfather worked for Domino Sugar. My uncle and aunt owned a small market in Mount Vernon. And my other uncle owned a produce business um, delivering to restaurants and businesses across the city. When I was around seven years old, I informed my mother that I was going to move from Cleveland to Baltimore and attend uh, Johns Hopkins University. I came close to fulfilling that statement. Um, I attended Goucher College instead. Uh, but I'd like to say that my time spent here exploring neighborhoods, and communities um, across the city with my grandmother, going to festivals, museums, engaging um, in, um, you know, we would drive all across the city. So I had a deep um, affection for neighborhoods and created a deep seated affection for the city at a young age. And that has been a driving factor in my work today. I'm excited to continue the work that I've begun as acting commissioner and to use my education, my government experience, leadership experience, um, and housing and community development expertise to help realize Mayor Scott's vision for Baltimore. In my government positions, I've been committed to developing strategies for interagency as well as intra-agency coordination and collaboration, increasing efficiency and effectiveness to enhance the resident experience, creating 
sustainable, resilient, growing, vibrant, and safe communities. As acting commissioner, I've been able to apply uh, my knowledge and expertise, expertise in a wide, uh, varied background that crosses everything from project management and finance uh, to development and construction, real estate, housing policy, community engagement, uh, of course, sustainability, um, fiscal management, legislative affairs, and strategic planning to effectively lead this agency uh, during my interim period. I want to use this opportunity to lay out for the committee some priorities for the department and start by recognizing the negative impact that housing policy has had over the years on our communities, from redlining, redlining to historic disinvestment. And let you know that I am committed to working to help redress those policies. Understanding the systemic issues that have plagued our city, I'm keenly aware of the intersection of health and housing and the generational trauma, both past and present, that must be addressed to move forward in an equitable, transparent, and efficient manner. The intersection of health and housing is a key priority for me, and I've taken action to priority, prioritize these efforts to address the social determinants of health. Housing is a key component to the health, safety, and well-being of our citizens, especially, especially our children. There is a critical role that the agency plays in helping to reduce trauma in our city and support violence reduction efforts. I've restarted quarterly meetings with the police department and am actively working with Director Jackson to identify areas within the agency where we can support the Mayor's Office of Neighborhood Safety Engagement and the Mayor's Violence Reduction Strategy. When I took on the role of acting commissioner, I immediately began to work on creating a culture shift within the agency, which includes a renewed focus on the priorities that I'm discussing today. I have an open door policy for all 390 plus DHCD staff. Um, they know that they can come and talk to me, whether or not it be in the office or virtually or through teams at any point in time, discussing any issues that they may have. And this has been something that has been welcome because uh, they've expressed in the past uh, frustrations over inaccessibility to ex executive decision-making structures or just being part of the larger focus and larger vision that we have within the agency as well as across the city. I fostered a culture of transparency, inclusiveness, and equity, both internal to the agency and external to the citizens of Baltimore. There is a clear objective within the agency to focus on the social, racial, and economic equity outcomes of our work. This supports Mayor Scott and his administration's focus on equitable neighborhood development. A key priority will be hiring the agency's first solely dedicated equity officer. Also, I have set the groundwork for an internal equity committee to work with the agency equity officer to evaluate internal practices and external policies and programs. Other priority areas of focus within the agency include, um, you know, our analysis and work that we're doing around our property disposition process. Um, we're actively undergoing that analysis and we're looking and finding opportunities for equitable changes. DHCD, um, you know, it, it's a comprehensive review of the disposition process in tandem with the comptroller's office and his effort on reevaluating um, disposition of city property across all agencies. We're reevaluating the engagement, the speed, the pricing, transparency around the revitalization of properties within the agency's inventories. You know, we're working to identify the knots in the system, such as outstanding liens that can cause process delays, um, court backlogs, as well as just having IT and uh, upgrades that are allowing us to create efficiencies for um, not only the public, but also staff in the agency. One of these IT upgrades that is underway as part of this evaluation of the disposition process is a new uh, program called Slate, which will transform how we um, interact and what is the current public facing um, improving what is the public facing um, inventory of city available properties. So the slate will take it from just being kind of a list of properties to having it look more like a um, 
multiple list system or going on Trulia or realtor.com where you'll be able to see the pictures of the properties, pricing, uh, click on the button, be able to support and supply uh, your application for the property. And then also on the back end, it provides us um, as staff the ability to efficiently move through the steps needed to help take that application and get it to a point of settlement. It also provides opportunity for us uh, within the technology upgrade to better monitor the properties um, after they've sold and to monitor uh, when permits are being pulled and what the condition of the property is and helping to move um, that property from vacant to obtaining its use and occupancy permit. Another um, IT upgrade that we're actively implementing right now is one called Clio to help with our attorney caseload management system uh, to work with our attorneys across our receivership, tax sale foreclosure, and um, working to create efficiencies that will help them uh, do their job and be able to actively uh, move these cases forward uh, more efficiently. We've also in that same vein, looking to um, identify additional funding to hire two additional uh, attorneys and two paralegals to solely focus on our title work to be able to conduct in-house title work which uh, would expedite uh, receivership, tax sale foreclosure, and condemnation processes. One area as it relates to equity and transparency is improving our community outreach and education through increased engagement with the community at all levels within each division of the agency. And one way that we're gonna be looking at um, advancing this effort is offering monthly opportunities for open dialogue with the community. Um, a chance for community members across the city to bring questions, comments, um, or uh, talk about different issues that they may have, not just with staff, but also at the executive level and commission commissioners level um, of the agency to help improve the transparency and the communication that we have between the agency and our communities across the city. I'm committed to customer service and creating service expectations for both staff, uh, for the staff. We'll be implementing customer service surveys across all divisions within the agency. These were once limited to just one division, but we're gonna be expanding that effort so that we can learn and, uh, per and receive the feedback that we need to be able to receive from um, our constituents and the community so that we can um, improve our processes, improve our practices, and just be overall uh, better at our jobs and the work that we, the work that we deliver to the public. I'm going to focus on funding and resources <clears throat> to support legacy homeowners, building off of our existing loan and grant programs, working uh, with partners uh, to unlock and look at opportunities as it relates to um, Medicaid and Medicare funding to support um, our older adults, um, finding additional funding to support our housing upgrades to benefit seniors programs, and also working in conjunction with the Mayor's Office of Government Relations, um, advocating at the state level uh, for you know, project core level of investment uh, that is needed for community stabilization and uh, resources to support our legacy homeowners. Another priority in coordination with the administration is advancing opportunities to support affordable home ownership through grants um, and loan products, working with lenders to increase mortgage lending for purchases below $80,000. This is a key area of advancing equity and creating generational wealth within our communities. We'll continue our work to support uh, renters implementing the recently enacted right to counsel legislation. We are also increasing the production of affordable housing units. We're utilizing and deploying the affordable housing trust funds, um, the affordable housing trust funds uh, funds uh, through a, a number of different mechanisms um, and the approved uh, spending plan. We do want to engage and re-engage the public in evaluating that uh, spending plan and reviewing the priorities laid out several years ago to ensure that those priorities remain the same today. We're looking at retooling the inclusionary housing requirements. We're also seeking additional home dollars uh, from HUD that help us leverage 
the state's uh, CDA financing and low income housing tax credit program, as well as pursuing additional funding for affordable housing through flexible bond funds. Upgrading IT solutions and reviewing workflows to find efficiencies within the city's permitting, licensing and registration systems is also a key priority. Creating equity opportunities to support smaller minority landlords, businesses and contractors and homeowners utilizing these systems. How can we make it easier for people to um, have that user interface and make it easier for them to navigate um, submitting their registration or obtaining a permit for the work that they need to do. We're also evaluating and retooling the CDBG application, contracting and payment process to increase efficiencies and provide timely financial support to our nonprofit partners. We are keenly aware that this support is critical to our uh, nonprofit partners, some of which are um, smaller uh, minority led organizations where this funding is critical to their operations. We're also advancing our block level planning work with our communities with a focus on balancing equity and anti displacement tools with development and community stabilization efforts. I'll be working with director Ryer and the planning department to incorporate um, a comprehensive housing plan as part of um, their work on the city's um, comprehensive planning process that they are about to undertake as well. Another key area as we talk about our development and community stabilization efforts is supporting our minority led and our women led for profit and nonprofit developers, investors and contractors across the city doing this work, creating black wealth for our residents, our communities and our businesses. We'll continue to work with the administration and our sister agencies to effectively address illegal dumping. And as we continue to identify op opportunities to optimize and modernize our agency processes and tools, I focused on incorporating data analysis and key performance and economic indicators into our programs and projects within the agency. Having a keen sense and awareness of our data can help us um, make decisions as we move forward to creating equitable outcomes in our work, as well as also how to create and streamline opportunities across all of our processes and policies. In closing, I want to identify and recognize that one of the foundational prescripts that I've embraced is the fact that equity in housing and community development must begin with the acknowledgement that the history of institutional racism is undeniably woven into the fabric of the present conditions within our city. There must be an understanding and commitment to redress the longstanding race-based barriers and policies that have devastated neighborhoods, concentrated poverty, and created an affordable housing crisis. I'm committed to equitable housing and community development approaches to benefit all Baltimoreans. This is the impact that I hope to have in this role of housing commissioner to be part of a solution that changes the lives of our residents for the better, to end systems and policies that devalue persons of color, and to invest in historically disinvested neighborhoods within our city. I love Baltimore. I'm committed to, service of this, to the service of the city, and I believe that my skills, experience, and passion for the city and its residents uniquely qualify me for this position. Again, thank you for the opportunity to address the distinguished members of this committee this afternoon, and I'll stand by to, any, to answer any questions that you may have. All right, well, thank you very much, and I agree with your sentiments. I think you're very qualified for this position, uh, so thank you for your willingness to serve. Um, I will just go in the order of which I see my colleagues, Councilman Costello. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Acting Commissioner Kennedy, thank you for being here. Um, two things. Uh, first thing is I'm very concerned about the issues that you raised around permitting as well as um, property registration across a, a variety of, of the spectrum. Uh, can you please talk about your plans uh, to make improvements in those areas? Yes. Um, so we've been working with um, BSIT and have actually 
um, brought on a, a project a project manager and a business analyst that's starting to evaluate all of the internal workflows for permitting, um, as well as the registration, property licensing, um, alarm registration components. One of the things that we recognize is that we've we've made progresses uh, and made progress in this area over the years as it relates to permitting. You know, we, we rolled out e-plans, we have e-permitting, uh, created one-stop shop. Um, you know, we've implemented um, the, the needs of the licensing um, of our property licensing, rental licensing components, but we recognize that there's room for improvement. And one of the key pieces in terms of room, room for improvement is actually looking at um, IT solutions that provide better user interface and user design um, for ease of use by the customer and by the, cons by the constituents that we're working with that have to use these systems. Um, so we're undergoing uh, the analysis. We'll be working with um, Director Carter. We just spoke as recently as this week. The business analyst came on board last week. I'm also working with Deputy Mayor Carter on this issue as we move forward and other um, potential consulting opportunities um, to help us kind of reimagine and look at what solutions uh, we'll be looking to bring in um, potentially from outside sources, um, you know, or vendor capacity to help us realize the IT solutions that we need to streamline processes and, and not just streamline processes from the user interface from the customer facing side, but we also know that there's opportunity um, to help us create opportunities for those efficiencies on the staff side and back end as well. Thank you. Um, there are far too many people at your agency to thank, but specifically I wanna know uh, Deputy Commissioner Jason Hessler, uh, Peggy White and uh, Angelicia Banks um, who are doing a phenomenal job. Um, but in addition to the concern that I previously raised along with your response, I'm concerned about the staffing levels and, and the staff resources that they have at their disposal. Um, so I can only assume that you're doing everything you can to uh, ramp up their staff resources. Is that correct? That is absolutely correct. I've been in um, active conversations with Deputy Hessler, um, as as well as Assistant Commissioner uh, Byrne, uh, as well in her capacity, um, and and a staff to uh, fill positions. So unfortunately, we have had a number of vacancies that occurred within that division and and that kind of unit, um, and they're working with our HR department as well as. Um, you know, looking at temp, bringing on temp staff and so forth to provide uh, relief there. And also looking to see um, how to, you know, build into the budget and look for what additional staff we need to support that unit outside of just the vacancies that were occurring, that we're realizing at this moment. Um, I certainly appreciate you prioritizing that. And I would ask that uh, if you're getting pushback from BBMR, um, I'd like to be engaged in those conversations so that I can help on my end in capacity as chair ways and means um, because you all need to be fully staffed and you're not and that's a problem and we need to fix it and it sounds like uh, under your leadership you're aiming to do that so I, I appreciate that but please keep me updated and in, in you know the coming one to two weeks as to what I can do to be helpful um, because oftentimes BBMR does not um, uh, may not be thinking about things operationally like like you are so you just want to make sure that they they fully understand and appreciate that perspective and i'm sure when it's presented to them they will uh, the second thing item is uh, i want to publicly thank you for your uh incredible work and, and your entire team again too many people to thank uh kate edwards and and, and onward down uh, on the 800 blocks of harlem and edmondson uh, the upton gateway project uh, you have uh, navigated a extremely complicated situation um, with uh, an unparalleled level of uh, grace uh, and expertise uh, and ability to see things uh, through all sides and, and bring all parties to the table to help uh, move a project forward um, for all intents and purposes that, that should be and, and, and would have been dead uh, by now. So I want you to know I appreciate that, especially uh, your team's uh, engagement in the monthly utility work coordination meetings. Uh, it's good to know that, that Bill Berge, Tony Badan, et cetera, will continue to be involved. 
Uh, I have been nothing short of impressed uh, in the way that you have uh, handled yourself, again, in an extremely complex, politically complex, financially complex uh, situation. Uh, and, uh, you know, just want to let you know that you have my full 100% support and my vote today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Councilman Torrance. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this is a question I would like to reiterate to uh, Commissioner Kennedy. I serve a large portion of the Red Line communities in West Baltimore. And my question to you is, what is DCHD's approach to not only providing affordable home ownership and affordable um, rental units? Because too often in the conversation, we focus on rental, but not enough home ownership. So that's my first question, of course. Post. So um, creating affordable home ownership is is a priority for me. It's something that I've been working on um, for years in my capacity as deputy commissioner, and um, will continue to advance that work as commissioner of the agency. There's opportunities that we see that exist, um, like I mentioned in my statement about engaging. Um, our lenders in, in providing necessary mortgages. Um, there are properties available and homeownership oppor opportunities available for residents inherently within Baltimore City, um, kind of in that 80,000 and below range where um, you know it, the property may not need an entire gut rehab or it's been well-maintained by an older adult that's looking to, to move um, and helping to unlock private equity and private lending to help support those mortgages that provide um, home ownership opportunity. Working with our renters, um, you know, that are interested in, in obtaining um, and, and, and becoming homeowners, working with our nonprofit partners that provide homeownership counseling and really expanding beyond just the standard HUD homeownership counseling to really a model that is more along the lines of homeownership coaching to move people from um, renting to affordable home ownership. We're also um, continuing to identify the necessary funds that are needed in many situations across our neighborhoods, specifically in those that are disinvested, uh, formerly redlined neighborhoods where we're actively working with our um, developers, small developers, nonprofit, for-profit, um, where there is still that appraisal gap or what is needed to help um, create affordable home ownership outcomes while we look um, to renovate our communities. So it goes also to that focus of the balance of community development um, and, and advancing our communities without displacement as well. And, and what is um, what tools in the toolbox do we have to help deploy to create those opportunities? Uh, working with our community land trusts across the city and their focus on um, affordable home ownership and, and long-term affordability is also a key piece of our work in advancing that uh, through the support of the um, Affordable Housing Trust Fund and funds that have been identified uh, through that resource to support the community land trust. So I think that there's multi different layers here um, and it's looking at each layer and each approach uh, so that we can uh, create the outcomes that we see, which affordable home ownership not only um, is important just for um, creating housing stability in our communities and, and opportunity, but it also is significant as we look to the creation also of black uh, generational wealth across our communities too. Thank you, that was a good answer. <laughs> Um, my next question is related to one of the core functions of DCHC, which goes to um, illegal dumping and, and investigations of it and also permitting, right? I found that we often have, that we have systems in place that we can improve. And I would like you to speak to those improvements that we're here trying to make on that side of it in terms of code enforcement and also illegal dumping as well. Mm -hmm. So in terms of, you know, code enforcement, we've been uh, actively working with uh, Deputy Booker and his team just in terms of general uh, code enforcement across the city. Um, you know, we're evaluating um, just regular um, daily inspection routes. We're um, actively monitoring um, our performance as it relates to SRs. 
Uh, we're you know, looking at proactive versus reactive in terms of how we deploy um, those resources across the city in terms of tackling on the ground, you know, the boots on the ground, eyes on the ground. Um, our code enforcement team also actively engages on the violence um, reduction uh, strategies as well. We engage, um, unfortunately, it's, it, you know, we do do complete environmental assessments as it relates um, to after there has been a shooting in the neighborhood, but we are, uh, we deploy within that first 24 hours to complete um, uh, kind of environmental assessments of the surrounding area, uh, vacant building structures, illegal dumping, et cetera. And the code enforcement team with Deputy Booker work extremely closely with Deputy Hessler as it relates to the special investigations unit, which is more focused on the illegal dumping side. Um, so that is one area where um, I'm going to be pursuing uh, different ways to help increase uh, the number of cameras that we have available to us um, and, and funding for that. If it's also um, pursuing uh, philanthropic dollars that might be able to support um, illegal dumping or additional cameras to help us in that effort, um, to not to support illegal dumping, but to support the additional cameras um, to, to combat illegal dumping. We do see successes. Um, you know, the agency was just successful in um, prosecuting an illegal dumping case around um, tires uh, with with somebody and working within the court system to um, get that successful prosecution. It is not easy, um, as you know, in terms of what it takes to build the case uh, for illegal dumping in terms of um, what is needed in terms of active photographs of the dumping happening, the license, like everything matching up. But we are uh, dedicated to doing our piece of that, as well as working with CEO Shorter and our other agencies with DPW um, and to uh, effectively address um, that illegal dumping across the city to the best of our ability and what's kind of in our control, but also being extremely supportive of the other agencies and how we can all come together uh, to find effective solutions on that. I appreciate that. I yield back to the chair. Thank you, uh, Councilman Conway. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and uh, thank you, Director Kennedy. Um, it's been a pleasure work, working with you for years and just to see you to come to this opportunity. I also want to congratulate you. Um, really excited to continue to work with you in, in this new official capacity, although you've been doing this, this work for some time now. Um, I, I got two pretty straightforward questions, um, one of which we talk about frequently, and, and you can probably guess where this one's going um, because I always ask you about it. Um, can you tell me a little bit about um, what you believe are opportunities to support or expand uh, the middle neighborhoods efforts that we're doing? Of course, um, this is a major initiative that we're trying to um, expand, of course, in the 4th district, especially in the east side of your road and uh, the Govins communities. Um, tell me a little bit about um, how, how you will go about expanding that work there. Mm -hmm. So. Um We've been fortunate enough to uh, be undergoing some of the middle neighborhoods planning effort with our partners in the planning department um, and really looking at um, expanding kind of tools and what it would take to have a city led middle neighborhoods um, revitalization effort and, and building off of some of the things that we actually already have in place. Um, so, you know, key areas in our middle neighborhoods are, are supporting our legacy residents. So we want to prevent decline um, and we want to also create opportunity um, for uh, new residents to move in. So um, expanding our, our loan, our existing loan and grant programs into our middle neighborhoods, um, working to address our vacant, any vacancies, um, our opportunities for working with Live Baltimore as well in terms of marketing for new investment, uh, the overlap of our middle neighborhoods and our 21st century schools and the work that we're doing around um, 21st century schools and in inspire planning and how that impacts our middle neighborhoods as well. All of that comes together to create an opportunity um, to really attract residents to those neighborhoods as well as um, continue kind of generational um, wealth building and, 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 and 
increasing our um, black home ownership within our communities as well. So, you know, it's a key area. It's part of the puzzle of everything that we're looking at um, within community development and, and, and advancing that work in an equitable fashion and how we're identifying those neighborhoods and what are the key indicators um, and, and where are areas that we can build off of our successes and uh, continue to overlap. And, and I would say that this talks a little bit more, not just from what we can do within the agency, but I'm going to talk again about collaboration and partnership with our other agencies. Because when we talk about middle neighborhoods, we're also talking about uh, kind of continued levels of service, right? And, 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 and that's across all of our communities, whether or not they're considered middle neighborhoods or um, or transitional neighborhoods, but how can we across all of our agencies continue to improve our level of service, whether or not that be with addressing vacancy or um, planting trees or street lights and, and that level of coordination and, and what we as, as the agency bring to the table, but also how we engage our other agencies to create outcomes um, up for all of the neighborhoods across the city, not just middle neighborhoods, but um, really looking at kind of funding strategies. How can we support uh, existing residents? How do we um, support, um, you know, attraction to those neighborhoods and um, and helping to also increase population across the city as well? So those are key areas that we're working on with Department of Planning, with Baltimore and Deputy Mayor Carter um, as part of just the overall mayor's vision um, for the city. Thank you. And, you know, I think um, well, I look forward to, to being hopefully your, your strongest partner on the council, although yeah. I'm sure everybody's looking to, to, to help on this regard. It, it's, uh, I think, a huge opportunity for us, especially if folks are um, moving within the city. I think there are a lot of strong opportunities right here in the city uh, that folks aren't always aware of. So uh, my, my other question um, is related, but um, a little bit different. Um, what, what in your opinion, and I think you touched on this a little bit in your opening statement, um, what in your, in your opinion are some of the opportunities that we should be exploring to speed up the receivership process? Um, you talked about some of the technology, but are there other opportunities that we can be exploring um, to improve that process? I, I look at it much like permitting. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So in terms of um, receivership, the key thing for us is the, to help in terms of expediting is that first piece. So we can't move any case forward until we've completed the full title examination. So that's really what's been identified as one of um, the key areas, um, which is why the in-house attorneys to help support and be solely focused on title work and title examination is key um, as we talk specifically about receivership. And that is what is needed as the foundational base to be able to be, build the case that then is taken and filed uh, within, within the court system, right? Um, after, after that, it, it, the Clio software will help create some efficiencies for our attorneys. Um, the legal tracking software and database that they're working off of right now is um, upwards of 17 years old, uh, 20 years old. So uh, moving to um, 20, you know, more advanced 21st century <laughs> tools um, are extremely important in that um, just from a staffing standpoint and their efficiencies from um, just caseload and database management and um, the ability that Clio also has in um, communication to make filings and do some other uh, fun things there. But after that really, um, you know, we're in the district court, right, for receivership. So um, we are somewhat beholden to that process. And, you know, receivership is um, the highest form and the highest level of code enforcement that we have as it relates to dealing with our vacant properties um, and our properties with the vacant building notice. So this is uh, something that we want to continue to advance. You know, we've had conversations at the district court level um, and, there are three outcomes with receivership, either, you know, the, the owner uh, steps up to the plate and takes care of their property and abates uh, the violation and, and abates that vacant building notice and obtains the use and occupancy permit. Um, or, you know, the court moves forward um, 
to you know appoint the receiver and, and they go through the auction process. So what's in our control really is that initial part, which is building the case, pulling the title work and getting that case ready um, and moving forward uh, with that. We still are unfortunately um, you know, catching up and at the court level from uh, closures related to the pandemic and COVID. Um, so we're still trying to catch up from our 2020 cases um, and then hope uh, as things continue to improve um, to be able to see some additional efficiencies. But I, I will say that we were definitely impacted uh, by the court closures that has delayed us somewhat. Thank you. And, and once again, um, as uh, I know every single one of us is, is dealing with this in some way, shape or form, some more than others, but certainly um, wherever I or my colleagues, and I'm pretty confident I can speak for them um, on this, as I know I can't on many things, we are eager to be helpful um, in, in addressing the vacant issue, the vacancy issue. So um, looking forward to continuing to work with you and, and thank you for all your service and I look forward to much, much more of it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, Councilwoman Ramos. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and colleagues. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Kennedy, for everything that you're doing. I echo my colleagues' sentiments about the um, great job that you've been doing and um, look forward to, to working with you. Um, I have a few questions. Um, <clears throat> the I'm trying to figure out where to start. <laughs> um, I um, was curious about uh you're um continuing to which i agree with you on making sure that we are making strategic investments um in our black and brown communities to be able to help our legacy residents but also to make sure that our legacy residents have neighborhoods that they can be proud of and um be uh safe and healthy and um so this is going to take massive subsidy <laughs> And so I'm curious to know uh, sort of how you are um, uh, starting to position the department to be able to address this issue and also the subsidy that's needed both, you know, we obviously know the private sector is involved, but we've got to really beef up the budget that you have in order to actually make this work. So, you know, in your discussion, I don't know if you're liberty to say, but if in your discussions, um, you know, what what are you looking for in order to make sure that all of this is happening in terms of money? Um, so the need, I think every everybody knows that we have a significant need in, in the city of Baltimore to address our housing and community development, whether or not that's from our historic um, legacy residents to creating affordable um, home ownership opportunities to addressing um, our vacancies and, you know, main, even maintenance of city owned properties. So, uh, you know, we're looking at different functions and ways, um, not just from, you know, city resources, but also broader. So one of the things, you know, how can I work with the private uh, lending institution on increasing access uh, to to mortgages and lending opportunities for our lower income residents. Um, also um, having conversations with uh, Deputy Mayor Carter and the mayoral um, administration in terms of what opportunities exist and, and how we can identify opportunities within um, the city's budget or you know, city's capital budget that could be supportive. Um, also looking outside, you know, I've had conversations with uh, Director Mayhew and MOGR on what opportunities also exist at the state and what we could be looking at, um, you know, for a project core level investment, like I stated in the out um, in my statement, you know, project core level investment, not solely, um, you know, they, there has been investment from project core in redevelopment, but, what, you know, it had to focus on uh, demolition, but how do we get a level of investment and support from the state? to also support um, some of those stabilization activities, which are legacy residents, stabilization of vacant properties next to occupied properties, strategic, uh, strategic demolition, um, and helping to kind of achieve whole block outcomes that we can, um, as we've been looking at, uh, you know, strategic block level planning approaches. So, you know, there's, um, the need is vast, you know, we, we have, probably around 25,000 properties in the city of Baltimore 
um, that staff has been doing analysis on where the deed has not transferred in 25 years plus or more, which, um, and these are showing up as what should be occupied properties as well. So we're also trying to determine if any of these are just unoccupied properties um, or also could have a VBN potential for them. But we anticipate that majority of these are occupied. And if we know what we know about deferred maintenance costs and so forth, you know, we, on average, we, we move with our uh, rehab office, weatherization, lead hazard reduction, and the work that we do to kind of help leverage all of those sources of funds. Um, you know, we provide anywhere from 15000 to, you know, $25,000, dollars worth of assistance to residents. So when you talk about potentially a pool of twenty to 25000 properties that need assistance in that 15000 to $25,000 range, we're talking about a significant sum of money, upwards of $400 million, $600 million, just to be looking at our existing kind of legacy residents. So, um, keenly aware of, of the need and actively uh, looking at all different approaches, innovative approaches, private um, funding sources, philanthropic dollars, um, other private investment uh, sources outside of uh, just city, state, and federal sources that we can leverage to help tackle this problem. Uh, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, uh, I think the the price tag is you're you're right on that, and that was only one aspect of all of the work. So it's um, really significant, and I I believe we do need as a city to make an, a significant investment in our communities. Um, both again, as I stated, for the um, the health of the communities and the health of our residents, but it's also a violence prevention tool. I think it is uh, the number one um, uh, violence prevention tool personally. Uh, the other question I had um, was around um, the, um, I'm really, really happy to know, and obviously we've been working together on thinking through the, um, the reforms of the disposition process um, as we've been thinking about um, a possible land bank in the city. One of the things I was curious about is how um, uh, the current disposition process, uh, both at the comptroller level and also at DHCD, uh, is um, well. Re receivership is trans; it, it can be transparent, except that we're not. Um, we may communities don't always have control over the properties, um, and so I was kind of curious. Uh, you know, if we're going to be accelerating, which I hope we can, <laughs> um, receivership. Uh, and also the fact that, you know, the current tech sale is such that, you know, the properties are auctioned and no one knows what's happening once they, until they start being um, uh, rehabbed. So how, what, what are the thoughts around um, this, this transparency and control of the outcome of the property issue? I mean, we have zoning and we have the plan, the comp plan, which I'm very excited about. Um, but how do we know that who's going to get the properties is actually going to be in the best interest of the community? Mm -hmm. Um, I think I, I would want to kind of separate that out um, from a couple different things to be clear that within the receivership process, um, the city does not, um, the city at no point in time takes ownership or takes title um, to the property. And that receivership is also a code enforcement tool um, that is used to help um, address the vacancy process. It is specifically uh, in, in, the, in the code um, related directly to um, the nuisance abatement of that vacant building and that vacant building um, notice. And the receivership process is meant to push that owner um, to address that violation and address that vacancy uh, piece. And then, um, you know, go to auction and then the auction as the receiver does have a fiduciary responsibility um, to move that property per, you know, court order and so forth. So, you know, we're willing uh, to look at and evaluate um, what other tools or mechanisms or if, if something uh, needs to be addressed at um, a legislative level that would potentially open the door for kind of the receivership uh, end of it and and having more community say at that level. Um, I think that that would be something, but at this moment in time, uh, the receivership process itself 
does not inherently allow for that because receivership is not a community development tool. It's a nuisance abatement code enforcement tool. Um, and, you know, we have to be very uh, careful within that because it's also uh, wanting to make sure that um, we're focused on that and, you know, that's where we're going um, so that we are not uh, looked at or if there isn't any gray area where someone could uh, consider, you know, a taking of, of their home and, and so forth, which is constitutionally um, you know, we have to abide by the rules of our, you know, country and the constitution and, and property rights and so forth. So um, I just want to be clear in terms of separating out when we talk about community engagement and um, community involvement as it relates to, um, you know, the end use of a property or, um, you know, speed of which something is being developed and so forth, that receivership is in its world over here on the code enforcement side. Um, and then when we talk about tax sale and tax sale foreclosure, um, that's different because at the end of a tax sale foreclosure process on a vacant property or vacant lot, not tax sale foreclosure on anyone um, that is occupied, we do not foreclose on properties that are occupied. Uh, but when we're talking about vacant properties and vacant lots, there we do have more control because at the end of that process, the city takes title to the property and then we end up putting it in. And, um, you know, we have a robust community engagement process um, that does exist around our um, disposition process as is, and it, it's robust and we're looking always for suggestions on how to, um, how to, you know, increase that level of engagement, improve that level of engagement. Uh, but I just wanted to make sure that we were clear on kind of the separation of the two and, and how those are addressed. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. Um, it's um, these are all very complicated tools <laughs> and um, yet, you know, if they're working all together, hopefully we can move um, move a lot of the properties um, forward. Mr. Chair, I have a couple of other questions, but I can yield um, if another council member has questions. You can keep asking your questions. Okay, thank you. Um, so um, I uh, want to go back to the permit office. Um, I'm also very excited that there will be reforms there. We had a couple of situations in my district where um, there was obviously miscommunication between the office that approves the plans and the inspector and the contractor in between uh, where uh, the plans were approved and then um, you know the, the inspection failed and it was because the plan should not have been approved and so i wonder if you can talk i mean you talked about the sort of technology piece but there's also this aspect of you know the right hand and left hand understanding what's going on can you talk a little bit more about that yeah, so I, I think that there's a two part process to that in terms of addressing that question and that issue. One is on the technology side so that there is um, better ways for staff to even kind of know where things are and 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 um, what next steps are and what's expected and kind of um, what that flow is. And then also I have had conversations with uh, Deputy Hessler and Assistant Commissioner Patel and and his team um, and Assistant Commissioner Unwriter as well in terms of just overall um, reinforcing continued um, education and continued training and continued um, conversations amongst staff to help ensure. And this goes, I think, to um, kind of that statement overall about chief shifting and changing culture within the agency at all different levels and um, with a heightened sense too on how just overall culture shift and communication and transparency translates not just in terms of how we communicate with ourselves within the agency, but also how we communicate with our constituents, with the general public, with contractors, builders, homeowners, et cetera. So um, it's really working on improving um, training across the agency, focus on um, not just the technical training pieces, but also the um, you know technical training, customer service training, and overall, um, you know, driving home that uh, level of commitment to collaboration with each other. So 
it's it's tied together, I think, in terms of not only just the process and um, you know the process piece, transparency, what the technology will bring, but it's also the human component, um, which drives home in terms of culture, training, uh, focuses on customer service and just overall culture within the agency. And I guess that also goes with what you said earlier around the staffing uh, yes. challenges that you have as well, that there could be some of this um, because of the staffing. Okay, thanks for that clarity. Um, I appreciate it. Um, and then, um, as you know, there are several projects out and about that um, had gotten sort of started, but then have stalled one big one in my district, as you know. Um, could you talk a little bit about um, how, how we're going to avoid something like that happening in the future um, in terms of whether it's a process issue or whether it's a, you know, because what's left at in this project and a couple others across the city is infrastructure money that the city is responsible for. And so we want to make sure that these pro projects go to completion. Um, and so how do we make, well, first of all, well, we're going to work really hard to advocate very strongly to make sure that Tivoli, Park Heights, and a few other developments are done, but making sure that it doesn't happen in the future where we have a groundbreaking and yet three years later, we still don't have buildings. Um, so I think um, for me, as I look to address this, it, I think it's part of process and then also um, teeing up a project for success with an understanding and a clear understanding of what will it take from the onset to get that process, that project from A to Z and everything in between. Um, and the impact that it does have on our communities um, when we do have an announcement of an RFP or we do have something along those lines where then it is delayed because there wasn't um, enough, not that there wasn't thought put into it, but maybe not enough thought or, or, or the exact uh, trajectory of what the exact plan is um, to be able to fully fund um, whatever the city component pieces of a project would be and how that lays out. So it really is looking overall at you know, those larger development processes and um, identifying funding um, ahead of time, or at least having a really clear understanding of how that will play out over, let's say, one to two years within a capital budget versus five years or six years within a capital budget as well to move a project from A to Z. I think um, coordinating with um, our other agencies from DOT and DPW um, to leverage other funding sources and infrastructure uh, with those agencies and have kind of um, better coordination and understanding of what's in their capital budgets, how that ties in on specific projects. We've been doing that uh, with them on a number of things right now, especially around Park Heights and, and Tivoli to kind of see what is planned, how can we, um, what Monday might exist, how can we leverage additional fund and really kind of streamline to take a number that may at the onset be uh, much higher than it might need to be in terms of finding that gap or what that gap is. So um, for, for me, it is a understanding of the impact that the delay in completion of these projects has on community and not wanting to put community in that position in the future. And whatever it takes on my end in terms of the planning pieces of it, and the clear communication of what the planning piece is like, you know, to say something is in the demolition pipeline versus this is in the demolition pipeline and it currently we have funding for X, which means that this will potentially not be happening for X. So it's, it's using additional descriptive uh, words to help, um, you know, to help set what expectations are, clear expectations, because one thing we know um, is, you know, expectations um, and unmet expectations can lead to resentments and, you know, resentments lead to anger and frustration. And I know that in a number of communities that will, that's what we have. So clear communication, 
um, setting those expectations and being clear in that uh, moving forward. And also, um, you know, having as many ducks in a row on the planning side ahead of time so that we can communicate that with our residents uh, is extremely important and where we will be moving in the future. And not just future, that's what we're working on now. That's is, what, okay. is kind of resetting and, and redressing those. Right. So you're sort of um, trying to manage expectations at the moment. And, and I know that that's been difficult. Um, I know. Um, so the, my last question um, is uh, around um, the Affordable Housing Trust Fund, my baby, of course. Um, I'm um, uh, thrilled about how uh, the department has been um, working uh, for moving forward on the, the trust fund. I'm curious, you may have mentioned it, and I'm sorry if I missed it, if the department, once the new commission is sworn in, will, uh, well, actually, we haven't even approved them yet. They haven't even been introduced. Um, whether there'll be another um, public process to determine the priorities um, of the trust fund. And you're nodding your head, so I guess so. Um, and then also, um, we're trying to explore our, our current funding source is only giving us maybe $8 million where we wanted um, much more than that. And so I'm curious if you have um, some ideas about um, enhancing the trust fund funding source. Mm -hmm. um, so I was nodding my head and I, I briefly mentioned it in my opening remarks, but we do uh, want to, you know, it's been several years now since we had kind of the initial robust community engagement process around uh, the spending plan priorities for the trust fund. And, you know, I'm one to say that it's always good to revisit those um, and, and re, you know, engage the public. Is this still a priority? Is this a priority? Does something come off? Does something go on? Does something get more weight than others? Um, so we are going to be looking to do that uh, probably starting sometime in the spring after the new commission is seated and then working to have that um, engagement process happen. In terms of um, you know, additional funding for the trust fund, it is on my radar. I don't have anything specific at this moment in terms of um, saying that you know, I've brought up a specific item with the deputy mayor or the budget office or anything about how to increase that uh, those funds, but it is something that um, I have you know, talked with staff about. I've brought it up uh, in the general context of, of budget needs because, you know, the, the need for affordable housing um, is even greater when we think about than just what even the original kind of goal of the $21 million a year on the trust fund side would set out to be, right? Um, so I think it's incorporated in my thinking as we look holistically at the entire landscape and, and different levels of the pot of what's needed um, to support affordable housing. And, and specifically the trust fund is geared, you know, towards that 30% and below AMI, and then also that 50%. Um, so it's how do we leverage that funding, but also knowing that we have a significant need as well, um, you know, above 50% AMI um, as a focus when we talk about affordability um, and, and what is needed. So, it's it's part of the general um, holistic approach and you know we'll be needing to kind of see what opportunities exist and and what um, could be at play to increase funding there yeah and trying to make the maximum impact um, with that funding uh for for units i mean we need we need units period end of story and so um i'm uh i'm looking forward to working with you on that i have a couple ideas so um we'll um, go from there. And uh, I really thank you for your time and answering my questions today. And I look forward to um, voting for this, uh, your com your confirmation and also working with you moving forward. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilman Burnett. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, Acting Director Kennedy, um, would, uh, at this point, fourth or fifth, uh, my colleagues um, in support of uh, you, taking on this position permanently. Um, absolutely been a pleasure to work with you and the members of your team to address uh, any number of issues in, our, in uh, my district and across the city. So I'm um, looking forward to voting yes. Um, did want to 
ask you, uh, you touched on it a little bit, uh, but one of the, the things that, you know, I'm, I'm, I intend to work on in the next few months is uh, trying to push for um, ways that we can address things like illegal, illegal dumping and blight through uh, environmental design. Uh, I know it's something that uh, Council Member Conway uh, has been pushing as a from a public safety lens, which I'm in full support of. Uh, but just thinking through what are some other ways beyond, um, you know, uh, pro cameras would like to see more of them. Uh, but are, are there other things that we can do uh, to prevent dumping, um, to better address the blighted conditions of many of the vacants that are city owned? Obviously, the privately owned ones require sort of a different set of tools. But um, just your your general thoughts on you know some outside of the box things that the agency is looking at or exploring or thinking about um, that can better and, and more creatively address the challenges of, of, of blight um, in the city of Baltimore. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've had some really good conversations with uh, Director Jackson about this as we look um, at our violence uh, pre uh, prevention strategies and overall kind of um, how environmental design impacts um, our communities and how we can use utilize tools um, to address blight and and make these changes. So, you know, there are working with community. I think we've been successful in some instances of um, thinking differently about how, um, you know, some it's been working with communities on alleys and alley closings and, and greening efforts within alley, you know, kind of that greening, uh, blue alley, green alley effort um, in specific areas that if it is appropriate, right, and working with DOT on, on what that would take, I think there is opportunity there as we think about, um, you know, alleys and, and vacancies and, and, and existing homes and structures and kind of what works within each community. Um, and that's the other piece of this too, is that sometimes um, some of the tools in the toolbox uh, may work in one neighborhood or in one block or two blocks, but we need to think differently about deploying other strategies um, in another block just because of the function and 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 what um, is there. Uh, thinking differently about how uh, we utilize our um, corner, you know, corner lots within corner vacancies, our side lot program, um, that I think also contributes. Um, to those efforts that you're discussing um, and working with uh, the comptroller's office, we might be having some uh, creative solutions there as we think about um, kind of how to engage those spaces to help uh, prevent um, either illegal dumping or to create, um, you know, beautification efforts or things like that that shift, that start to shift the paradigm in communities, uh, which can help um, reduce some of the blight and the impact that we have in terms of just um, our, uh, you know, having there be invite, what I would call inviting spaces for um, for um, activities that, that contribute to, um, to our blight and also to violence with, across the city. So, you know, we're having those discussions. Um, I'm, you know, looking forward, I believe I have a meeting on the books with Director Jackson um, tomorrow, um, if if not next week, where we're specifically also um, engaging in discussion on this this topic and and how we can um, you know utilize the tools we have, but other innovative approaches and really thinking outside of the box in terms of what it means um, to utilize um, defensible environmental design to help us as we um, tackle these issues in the city. Thank you, and it's good to hear um, just overall that this is there's that uh, interagency collaboration. It's something that I uh, also to hear uh, when silos are being broken down because ultimately working in the same neighborhoods, we have the same vision, uh, and so it is good to hear. Um, the uh, second question I had uh, was around, um, and this is something that you and I have talked about, but um, just wanted to you know bring it up again. You know this issue of uh, sort of on the, the middle neighborhoods, but really the lens of seniors and uh, older adults. Um, can you talk about your, uh, I guess, efforts moving forward to 
uh, expand things like the weatherization program and, and senior home repair. Um, a lot of things that we know is in uh, aging neighborhoods, oftentimes that, you know, folks are aging in place, but their ability to maintain the house can, um, one, impact their ability to age in place or, or two, if they transition out of the home, make it difficult to uh, attract either a family member to come because there may be outstanding work uh, or to, to get on the market. It may not go, you know, where it should be um, at sale or just becomes dilapidated because of the work is, is too much. So I, you know, I very much view like those sort of supports as community stabilization tools, particularly in parts of the city like that I represent where there are a lot of older adults um, aging in place. Can you talk mm -hmm. a little bit about plans for the agency to, to build on um, the existing program that you have and any new and then innovative ideas uh, moving forward? Mm -hmm. I think um, a couple of key things. One, uh, weatherization, we, um, you know, we've actually had to go through a shift of uh, staffing within the weatherization program within the agency. So we're uh, getting back to a staffing level. We'll say that we have, this is one area where we've actually, um, it's been difficult to find um, some of the trained staff that we need to have um, with the credentials in place that are necessary to meet um, the requirements of our funding. So we've um, been looking at ways to, um, you know, bring in uh, staff members, pay for training, go through that. But even that, um, it is difficult because it, the training process could be like a seventh month training process while they go through to get the credentials needed. So we're um, working with the state. We have funding available. We know that there's going to be existing, um, you know, levels of funding that we'll maintain. And we're also anticipating to have an increase in funding for weatherization coming. Um, also, there was some weatherization uh, funding included in uh, the president's and the infrastructure uh, bill. So we know that there's going to be some energy efficiency and weatherization uh, work um, available there for increased funding. Our lead hazard reduction program is also a program that I want to highlight right now as we talk about this, because it's one people will kind of tend to focus on the weatherization program or tend to focus on our um, rehab program, the Office of Rehabilitation Services, and our partnership there with housing upgrades to benefit seniors. But we have an opportunity right now with a significant amount of funding available in the city for our lead hazard reduction program. And it is geared to, uh, you know, there has to be a child under the age of six living in the home. But what we found is that we have a significant number of older adults where um, there is a child under the age of six living in the home or a pregnant female living in the home because of the nature of our families in Baltimore. We have a lot of multi-generational families living under the same, on the, under the same roof. Um, and there is an opportunity there because also um, that program allows for um, visiting children. So if, if there's a visiting child under the age of six to the home that meets the threshold for the number of hours um, per week or per year, that house would also qualify. So if an older adult, um, you know, is helping out by watching their grandchildren or their nieces or their nephews or even their neighbors. It doesn't have to be a relative. I mean, it can also be just their neighbor's children. If, if, uh, if Mrs. Smith, you know, happens to be the person where the kids come after school, um, you know, for several hours per day while mom is still getting off of work, we're able to help um, in, with funding in those situations. And that funding can be leveraged with our rehab program. Um, there's specific healthy homes funding tied to our lead hazard reduction program. And I think that that's something that, um, you know, we, we definitely are increasing our outreach efforts on across the city and, and working to deploy those funds. So we have a significant amount of funding available right now. And we want to make sure that um, we're making as big of a difference as we can. So it addresses lead hazards, but we also have healthy homes funding available. It can help um, sometimes with roof repairs and also leverage with our rehab program um, where we can also sometimes also address things such as furnace replacement or electrical upgrade or um, other things that are a part of that. So it you know, looks at windows, doors, porches, um, and other components uh, to the housing structure to create overall lead safe um, and healthy homes. So I'd, I'd say that that's something that has not been um, pushed as, as much um, as we can in terms of just understanding some of the requirements that open the door. You know, sometimes it's like, oh, I just have to have uh, children in the home, but really it can also be the visiting child and 
Um, you know, we know that with multi generations in the home as well, this is an opportunity to tap into funding that isn't um, normally thought of as a way to support our older adults. Good to hear, and I look forward to, to learning more about it um, as the things move along. Um, Mr. Chair, the other thing I wanted to ask has already been touched on, so I'll, I'll stop here. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, any other uh, colleagues with any questions? If not, we will um, move to a vote. Uh, Richard, are you there? Yeah. Yes, Mr. Chair. Would you like to vote in the order the uh, nominees were heard or in the chronological order they were introduced in? Now, well, for, first off, can you elevate uh, Councilman Costello? He's on the attendee list. He dropped down there. He's under EC. Just a second. Uh, He doesn't show on my attendee list. Uh, I, yeah, I see him. He's at the bottom there. Okay, the last one I see is Tammy Hawley. Okay, do you, do you see EC at all on the attendee list? Oh, EC. Uh, there's an EC below Trump TV. Is that Councilman Costello? Yes. Okay. He is now a, he is now a panelist. Okay, excellent. Just below Commissioner Kennedy. Okay, um, so we could um, we can start uh, we can start with uh, Commissioner Kennedy and then um, let her go, and then we can we can move on to the other ones that we heard previously. Um, okay. So I would like I'd like to uh, to make a motion uh, to confirm Alice Kennedy for the commissioner of the Department of Housing and Community Development. Do I have a second? Second. Second. Um, so the motions by Schleifer, seconded by Ramos. I will do a roll call. Okay. Chair Schleifer. Yes. Chair Schleifer votes aye. Mr. Burnett. Yes. Mr. Burnett votes aye. Mr. Costello. Yes. Mr. Costello votes aye. I haven't seen the vice president, uh, and uh, she, she usually sends me an email. She has trouble getting on, so. So, I uh, assume we mark her absent unless we hear from her. Okay. Uh, uh, Member Ramos? Yes. Member Ramos votes aye. Mr. Torrance? Aye. Mr. Torrance votes aye. Mr. Conway? Yes. Conway votes aye. Mr. Chair, there are six votes in the affirmative, no negatives. We can go to uh, second reader on um, December 6th. All right, thank you. And congratulations, uh, Commissioner Kennedy. Uh, we'll move you forward at the next council meeting. Thank you all very much. Okay. All right, you uh, you and your team are good to go. And we will uh, move on to the next, uh, the next one, EA 21 dash. 0063, Dr. Yvonne Bronner. Uh, do I have a motion to move this nominee favorable? I move. Second. Moved by Burnett, second by Ramos. Okay. Richard? Chair, Chair Schleifer? Yes. Chair Schleifer votes aye. Mr. Burnett? Yes. Mr. Costello? Yes. Costello, aye. Uh, Vice President still absent. Member Ramos? Yes. Member Ramos was aye. Mr. Torrance? Aye. Mr. Torrance was aye. Mr. Conway. Yes. Mr. Conway votes aye. 
Mr. Chair, there's six votes in the affirmative, no negative. We can go to second read on December 6th. Okay, thank you. Next up is EA 21-0064, Odessa Dorkins, Member Commission on Aging and Retirement Education. I will move this nominee favorable. Do I have a second? Second. Second, uh, moved by Schleifer, seconded by Ramos. We'll do roll call. Okay. Ramos. Favorable. Chair Schleifer? Yes. Chair Schleifer votes aye. Mr. Burnett? Yes. Mr. Burnett votes aye. Mr. Costello? Yes. Mr. Costello votes aye. Vice President Dampson. Member Ramos? Yes. Member Ramos votes aye. Mr. Torrance? Aye. Mr. Torrance votes aye. Mr. Conway? Yes. Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair, there's six votes in the affirmative, no negative. We can go to second reader on December 6th. Okay, and the last one we're going to vote on today is EA 21-0065, Claudia Baylog, Member of Commission on Aging and Retirement Education. Do I have a motion uh, to move this nominee favorable? So moved. So it was Ramos move favorable. Do I have a second? Second. So moved by Ramos, seconded by Burnett. We'll do roll call. Roll call. Yep. Uh, Chair Schleifer. Yes. Chair Schleifer votes aye. Mr. Burnett. Yes. Mr. Burnett votes aye. Mr. C Costello. Yes. Mr. Costello votes aye. Vice President Thompson. Member Ramos. Yes. Member Ramos votes aye. Mr. Torrance. Aye. Mr. Torrance votes aye. Mr. Conway. Yes. Mr. Conway votes aye. Mr. Chair, there's six votes in the affirmative. No negatives. We can go to second reader on December 6th. Okay, thank you. And for um, EA 21-0066, um, we are going to hold a voting session on at our next hearing, which is December 2nd at 2.01 uh, p.m. Thank you, and we are now in recess. Okay. We're closing the meeting, Mr. Chair.